and I am a science teacher at Seahome High School in Bellingham, Washington. And before I taught high school, I taught five years of middle school science at Evergreen Junior High in Redmond, Washington. Um, like many of you, I have thought a lot about what school is going to look like next year. Um, that's the scenario. I think we could have a hybrid model of being in school some of the time in smaller classes and also have some online elements as well. Um, this makes me a little nervous because one of the reasons I teach is to be around students and some of my most successful lessons have been lessons that involve um, either lab activities or some sort of hands-on modeling to show science concepts. Um, this summer I have been working a little bit with 3D molecular designs in uh, helping them to uh, produce individually individual modeling kits that can be sent home with students um, to help demonstrate some of those key concepts that we usually teach in school. Um, I'm going to show you some of those today. I asked a couple of middle schoolers who I found hanging around my kitchen one day um, what they knew about cells. And this is, this is what I got from them. Um, they know that cells make up living things. They know that cells uh, need food and they need oxygen, so they have to get into the cell. And they know that cells need to get rid of carbon dioxide and other waste products. So in today's lesson, we're going to look a little bit further into how a cell gets the things that it needs into it and how it gets rid of its waste products. So today we are going to find two real live um, middle schoolers and we are going to um, attempt to teach them a little bit about uh, cell membranes. They are going to be given a little baggie of phospholipids like this in the baggie. There's also some water molecules in here as well. They will also be given a beaker of water, paper beaker of water, and they're going to do a couple of thought experiments based on the information we tell them about phospholipids. So phospholipids, as you can see in the picture here, and you probably already know because you're science teachers, have a hydrophilic head, so hydrophilic head likes water, and they have some hydrophobic fatty acid tails. So phobia, fear of, they have a fear of water in their tails. So they're going to have to arrange these phospholipids um, so that the phospholipids are very happy. So that the tails are um, not near water and so that the heads are near water. We'll see what happens. Okay, so at this point, um, I'm live again. I'm not sure if you noticed that was a video or not. I wore the same shirt so that it, you wouldn't notice the difference. But you know, um, the thing you're going to do is you're going to take your phospholipids, if you have them, and you're going to arrange them. So there's a film on the top of the beaker of water. Um, and you're going to try to make sure that the hydrophobic tails and the hydrophobic phyllic heads are very happy. So teachers, if you have the modeling kit right now, um, please go ahead and try this. And if you don't, um, you're going to see a real live middle schooler that may look a little bit similar to me. Try this at home. And this was um, done authentically. He had never seen um, the kits before. He has a strong um, sense that you should separate school and home. So this is real. Uh, if you have questions during this time, make sure you put them in the chat and Heather or Chris will get back. And let's listen to Evan now. Right. So, I, Evan, now I would like you to go ahead and make a, um, well, we're going to work on making a membrane. So, I would first like you to take eight of the phospholipids that are on your water beaker there. Looks like we already have eight. Count those up. Okay, and that beaker is full of water. Okay, it's fake water. And I would like you to arrange those so that the heads of the phospholipid, the heads of those like water and they want to be around water. And the tails are made of fatty acids. And as you know, like if you have water and fat together, they don't mix. The fatty acids do not like water. So take your eight phospholipids and arrange them so the heads 
like water or in the water, and the tails do not like water. Okay, so where are your tails there? In the water. I just told you the tails don't like the water. <laughs> yeah, not like the water. Okay, so do you think, do you think they're gonna be right next to each other or spread out? Or well, they're gonna matter? be spread out, but. Okay, because they, do you think they maybe don't like each other? We didn't really talk about whether they're attracted to each other or not, did we? Chill. They're pretty chill. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, so that that is pretty much how I remember middle schoolers being. They are uh, kind of sassy, and um, they do like to work with um, models with their hands. Um, I'd like you to think of a couple of these discussion questions as we go through. We have two more um, activities with the membrane. Um, can we go back to the uh, discussion questions for a second. Yeah, just one second. There it is. Sorry. There we go. Um, think about how you can turn this into a hybrid uh, distance learning on site lesson because if you think you're going to school, you may or may not be, depending on how things go in the last few weeks. So we're going to have to be pretty good at going from the idea of, of note to school possibility. Um, and then also having these be equitable learning opportunities for, for students um, inside and outside the classroom. Um, think about how this lesson might help promote that. That is also the key in getting districts to, to um, help support you with this. I found there's, there's this is a really big issue because trying to teach kids that, that traditionally um, could be missed is a really, really big deal at this point. So post any of your um, questions in our chat session as we move along. Otherwise, we'll go on to our next um, our next uh, thought experiment. Next slide, Chris. Okay, so at this point, you've got um, some phospholipids. lipids. I think I put 10 here, and they need to be submerged in water. Again, if you have your molecules, um, I'm really hoping that someone's going to raise their hand and show me how they turn out. So teachers, if you have yours, try to arrange these so they're submerged underwater, they're not on the top anymore. And the um, hydrophobic tails are away from water and the hydrophilic heads are in water. Give you a second to do that. And you can work, keep working on that as Evan works on his um, uh, submerged molecules. Do you wanna play that short video? Okay, your second task today, Evan, is to take the same eight phospholipids and know that the heads still like water and the tails are made of fatty acids and they don't like water. And you are going to have to arrange them so that they're submerged or they're underwater in the beaker. But like this still doesn't like water? Yes. So arrange them so that they're as happy as they can be. They can be as close to each other or far apart from each other as you like. Interesting. And why did you arrange them like that? I don't know, because there's no wrong answer. Oh, of course. We've told them that there's no wrong answer. Uh, could they be arranged in mm -hmm. any other way, do you think? Or do you think sure, that's they it? could be anywhere. But would they be happy at that point? No, but they, they don't need to be out of And Susan, before we move forward, I see Alice has her hand raised. So if, oh, uh, wonderful. Uh, Alice, would you like to come to the stage? I'm inviting you, so go ahead and click accept once you receive that. So I'm not sure how this is going to work with manipulating my screen here. Um, well, yeah, we can see I also it. didn't have the, the beaker of water. I've lost my beaker. I don't know how. I can you see that. There you yeah. go. Um, so, yeah, that's how I was thinking there. Um, because they, there would be like air on the inside and then the, the polar heads would be on the outside. Cool. I think we're all we're all having this challenge with cameras right now. I think you can't even get a webcam. They're sold out like forever in the whole world. So trying to manipulate with one um, laptop is challenging, but you did it and we can see that easily. Um, 
the kids could also just draw their own beaker yeah. of water as well. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah okay. you ready, for the, ready for the next challenge? Oh, yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next challenge then. Let me put you off the stage. All right. And we have two more hands raised, but if you don't mind waiting till the next thought experiment and maybe you can share those. Okay, your second tap. All right. Okay, so the third task here, this is the big one. It's going to end up being most like um, a cell membrane is you need to have the phospholipids uh, arranged so that they're submerged, they're underwater, and they contain water. And you can use as many phospholipids if you want. So teachers, right, through this. Um, in a class period, I have done this every year for, well, since I first attended the um, uh, 3D molecular modeling, I call it science summer camp. I've done this every year. And every year, kids come up with different answers. Um, one of the reasons I love this is that the kids that maybe always have the right answer on, on multiple choice aren't always the ones that are very, um, well, quick about trying to figure out solutions where there's not a solution in the paragraph ahead of it, ahead of the question. So I've had a lot of kids that have become stars of the class over their uh, molecular modeling when they haven't necessarily had that science content before. So it's, it's really fun to see different kids um, try to manipulate these models to come up with a solution. Okay, so let's see how Evan tackles this one. All right, before I do that, is there anyone who wants to share? You just raise your hand, share how you came, what you came to. Oh, did they unraise hands? They did, yeah. Uh, so, okay. Um, oh, wait, here, Fran has one to share. So I will invite you to the stage, Fran. Fran, excuse me. Remember, teachers, we're always interrupted. It does not bother me to be interrupted. In fact, it makes me feel like I'm still teaching, which I really Hi, Fran. Hi. I'm just going to have to tilt. I don't have another camera. Yeah. Oh, I, okay. Yeah. Okay. And see it okay? And you did that directly on your um, counter. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And you, yeah. well, you, you went above and beyond here, and you threw some water in there. Yeah. Cool. I did. Oh, no, you're right. I did see there was water in it. it and around water in it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, clever thing I did with the water because um, they come just white. I just took an expo marker and I just dotted the center of each one of them on both sides while it was still in the um, in the sheet of molecules. It took like 10 seconds. That's a, yeah, that's a and great the idea. The negative charge. Some kids will take hours and draw a perfect little red circle. But that's a great that's idea. Great. Thanks, Thanks for sharing, everyone. Brand. Sure. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's see how Evan tackles this. All right. So Evan, now we're going to do something a little bit more complicated. You can have as many uh, phospholipids as you want. And remember, with the phospholipids, um, does this part, does the head like or not like water? It it's hydrophilic. It likes water. Yes. And the tails we call hydrophobic. So it's not, it's not like water. Phobic means afraid of. So they're afraid of water. Yeah. Now, you're going to have to arrange the phospholipids so that they are both submerged in water. This is your water level here. So they're underwater. And so that inside of them, there's also water. So this is going to be very similar to what a real living cell is like. Because a real living cell has a lot of water on the inside of it but it also has water on the outside of its membranes. Oh, that is really interesting. How come you're putting those um, tails together? Because the tails don't like water. Yeah, okay, so they're gonna be together and now we're submerging them. And so they're more happy. They're more happy, excellent, okay. Um, but we need to have water on the inside of the membrane, so how would you like to um, modify that a bit? Well, you just take one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Huh. Um, you have all of them to work with here. And so do you want to add some more sure. um, so that they're, they, 
don't have a lot of water that's touching them. Because I can see that like right here and here, there's still looking water touching yeah. these. Yeah, so you can make them, you can use as many as you want, make them as compact or spread apart as you wish. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Oh, he's still going. The video has gotten very slow and glitched. Sorry. Yep, I will move on to the next slide. Okay, next slide. Um, we've got a couple questions um, at this point that I would pose to your students. Um, I like to have them share their models here, and we already um, saw models from um, two of our participants. So if anyone else wants to share theirs, we'd be happy to um, call you to the stage. If you came up with something maybe different than um, our classic uh, liposome that you see in the picture here, um, students always come up with something different. And then it leads to the conversation of what um, about that follows the characteristics of these um, phospholipids and what maybe doesn't follow those characteristics. Um, there's always something interesting and cool about someone's unique model. We're all adults, so sometimes our creativity is a little different than students. Try to get a few more middle schoolers, but they're hard to come by right now. You're supposed to like stay around your own kids and not have friends over, so that's sort of limited there. But it is really fun to do in the classroom. You will come up with some very unique answers. Um, so another uh, discussion questions is um, after you look at whether there's more than one way to model this, um, Think about whether or not the fatty acid tails are shielding the cells from water or not. Let's we move on to do you think this is really what a membrane looks like? So modeling um, is the models always have their limitations. There's no perfect model. This is not what a cell looks like, but this is a nice start to what the membrane of a cell looks like, and it's a perfect introduction once we have the membrane down to see how things get in and out of the cell. So just like um, I think in middle school, um, a lot of us um, do models of the cell with jello or cake or some other edible thing. You have organelles inside the cell, and that's a model, and it's got some limitations to it, but it helps kids remember different parts of the cell. This is uh, um, the same idea. It's, it's a model, and it's got some really cool parts about it, um, and then it has some limitations as well. So this does not contain all of the different parts of a membrane. Um, it, but it does help us understand some unique features about it. So we're going to go into, at this point, um, one of the cell processes. We're going to focus on respiration today. So in middle school, um, I remember that in a respiration, let's go on to the next slide there, Heather, or Chris, sorry. Um, I remember that I, would, I memorized, and I was very good at memorizing, um, glucose plus water um, made carbon dioxide, and um, water, and then this magic substance called ATP, which was um, basically just a little cartoon with yellow on it, and it said ATP. And um, that's what I remember. But glucose in our kits looks like this. And this shows um, carbons and oxygens. It does not have the hydrogen in it. But you can tell it has, um, we've got six um, carbons, and we have 12 hydrogens and six oxygens. This is a sizable molecule to be squeezing through our little phospholipid membranes. And we've told them by this point that these things move around a bit. They're not completely solid. But let's just get out the um, larger mo uh, model here um, that's in your uh, pockets. And you can see that the glucose here is pretty big. It's probably not going to get through these phospholipids. So what to do, what to do, we're going to have to make our model a smidge more sophisticated. So when you feel like your students are ready for that, we're going to move on. Um, next slide, Heather, for Chris. How are we going to get glucose into the cell? Because I know that the cell needs glucose um, in order to um, make this magic ATP that apparently runs everything. So in our kits here, we have, I've shown four pictures here, and um, this is called GLUT1. So I'm going to, it's right here, there's GLUT1, 
And if you have this, um, I'm hoping that you set this up ahead of time, a couple of people. Um, this is a protein. It's an example of a carrier protein. And when glucose runs into it, it changes shape so that glucose can get to it. And so if you play around these things, you have to move. Okay? And we'll have you guys manipulate these and see them if you can. And you have to know about um, point one is that it only will allow um, glucose to get across the membrane. And it will only typically go in um, it's passive transport. It takes no ATP. So it only will be moving um, glucose from a high concentration to a low concentration as far as net um, But it's a very specific protein that only deals with glucose, but it helps get that glucose across the membrane because it's simply too big to get. Are there any questions so far? Okay, I see Carla says, were the at-home models uh, meant to have two sets of brown foam membrane enzymes? One to a fit the linear model and one to the circular model. I can answer um, that, I, Susan. I was trying yeah. to answer that on the list. So the packs that we sent at home, these were our first run of packs. And then working remotely, I hadn't necessarily realized that um, we did have some problems with those. The packs that we sell and distribute are just going to have those round membrane sheets in there. And then the straight okay. membrane pages are actually going to be free downloads that you guys can print. Yeah. And so you, you won't type, get two you sets. Want to type. Um, you won't get two sets of those membrane tops. But if you want to use a straight membrane, you can. You just have to take them off the one set and put them on the other. Yeah. As long as you use a ballpoint pen um, first before you put the brats in, they work fine. Okay, so that's GLUT1. So we've solved one problem of how we get um, glucose in to the cell. Um, there has to be enough glucose for it to just simply run into that carrier protein. Um, if there's not enough glucose and it doesn't have the probability of running into it, you're not going to get glucose across into your cell. All right, let's look at the next slide. Okay, so we know that water is a really important part of cells. We know that cells have to um, regulate the amount of water that's going in and out. Um, we know that water is actually a waste product of respiration. Glucose and oxygen go in, the mitochondria does its thing, and then um, carbon dioxide and water are produced in that reaction. So water needs to be dealt with. Um, kids often have the misconception that water just goes through the membrane squeezes through the membrane, but water is the very definition of hydrophilic. Water loves water, loves itself. And so it can't squeeze through because the hydrophobic fatty acid tails would repel it, and it just wouldn't make it through. So the solution to this problem is another protein, so we're going to make our membrane even more sophisticated, and it is called aquaporin. Aqua, water. You're not going to forget this one. Um, and it has a very specific size and shape. And the interior of it is hydrophilic. And so water can go right on through. Again, it's a passive transport. So this is not requiring ATP as long as the molecules are moving from um, high concentration to low concentration. The yellow arrow there shows you which one of these is supposed to be aquaporin as far as the models go. So I have another um, ex thought experiment for you on our next slide. So teachers, if you could set up a system where water molecules have a higher concentration outside the cell than inside, that would be great. And at this point, I like to talk about um, molecules. They don't have any, they don't think. Somehow kids think about diffusion, they're like, oh, things go from high concentration to low concentration. And really, they just move. And so if you have a setup here with a higher concentration of water outside the cell than in, it's simply more crowded at that point. And if everything's moving randomly, have the kids think about what are the odds of them running into that aquaporin um, molecule and being able to get through. 
is that this would be a great time if anyone had um, was able to set up the system where the water molecules are higher outside than in. That would be one really cool thing to look at. And then that's the super fast worker who then had all the molecules move randomly and could show us might ha what might happen to the water molecules over a period of time. That would be a second great hand raise. We've got Diane Diane will share with us. Hi, Diane. Hello, hello. Let me take my computer and... Oh, oh yeah, we can see it perfectly. There you go. So Great. higher Fantastic. outside, low inside. High outside and low inside. Fantastic, Diane. Is there anyone that wants to show us my... It looks like after the, those water molecules are just moving randomly over a period of time. If we don't have any di uh, hands, we might call on Diane again. Do you want me to move them? Oh, I see uh, Alice has her hand raised also. So oh, perfect. Let's call on Alice. Bring you to the stage as well. Help my computer again and see if we can get it. So I've got some. Ah, I'm really not good at this. Um, and we can see it. We can see outside and. Yeah, I had four on the outside on each side, and then I had one, two on either end of the inside of the aqua. Okay. And then there was, a, was there about an equal number inside yes. the cell? Yes. Okay. Cool. And so then we start talking about equilibrium, um, which brings up another misconception that students oftentimes think that equilibrium, they all just stay that point they're just like hanging out we're all equal we're going to stay right where we are and it can go back to the idea of all those molecules moving randomly and you may have some movement of water but you're probably going to end up with about the same concentration on each side and so Susan, i'm going to give you a 10 minute warning okay and and I think we're, we're, in good, we're in good shape yeah, I'm just going to let everyone know that NSTA will be sending out a um, survey at the end of this that you can answer at your leisure. So there should be a link that will go to you um, for this workshop. So go ahead, Susan. Cool. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to move on to the next slide, Chris. So in this presentation, I really just focused on um, respiration because I know that um, I know that um, respiration is just one of those things that we talk about in middle school. And so we keep going back to what needs to go into the cell and what needs to go out of the cell. And so we've talked about glucose going in the cell. And we have a special carrier protein. We've talked about water getting out of the cell. And we've used aquaporin for that. But now we have oxygen and carbon dioxide to deal with. We, know, we all know that we need oxygen. Um, and we know we need to get rid of carbon dioxide. So while we don't have specific molecules for those, you can easily make some or just talk about them. Oxygen only has two atoms in it, has two oxygen that hang out together. And it's very, very small. Um, carbon dioxide only has three um, atoms as well, carbon and two oxygens. Again, they're neither hydrophobic nor hydrophilic. And if you get out your cell model again, you can see and talk about how the phospholipids are not still. There is some movement between them. And if something is very, very small and typically uncharged, it can squeeze its way through. Um, it can squeeze its way through those phospholipids. And so oxygen and carbon dioxide truly can simply diffuse through the membrane typically going from higher concentration to lower concentration. And again, this is fun to get out again um, after you're done studying cells. If you're looking at the um, respiratory system, you can get this out again and really talk about how oxygen and carbon dioxide are changed in the lungs and into the bloodstream. And then once again, from the bloodstream into the individual cells. So it's, it's, um, it, it really is a, a model that just keeps on being useful over time. I just keep adding to it. Um, we're going to some questions. This is a good time for questions. Otherwise, we'll just keep going. 
Okay. Heather, you're muted, but I think Heather might be oh. reading the questions. Okay. Yeah, I'm so, Heather. Yeah, I'll read them as they come up. So if you post them in chat okay. or you raise your hand, we will we'll start discussing them. And I think uh, Susan has just a slide or two. Fran says, great ideas on how to teach abstract concepts using the models in a virtual setting. Yeah. I also find that students who have used these models early on do not get as freaked out in chemistry because they've heard some of the vocabulary, some of the chemistry vocabulary. And it, and it also ties it into something that's a little bit more meaningful to them than just chemical equations that are attached to a, a living process. Okay, let's look at the next slide. Okay, now I, I remember when I used to teach before we got sent home on March 13th, um, when I used to teach with students, that sometimes parents would call and say that their students were not being challenged enough and they wanted some optimal extensions. And so in a middle school setting, there's lots of extensions with this um, activity. Um, we could talk about gated channels, and that's highlighted in the slide right here. Um, and those little purple squares are um, potassium ions. And they're a part of, of all different cells, but in particular, um, they're very important with um, neurons. And so neurons communicate with each other um, by um, causing an action potential, which is actually a jolt of electricity. And they do this by moving um, different sodium and potassium ions into and out of their cell to cause a difference in charges, which is what the action potential is. So this, this could definitely be used um, as an optional extension for those students that are looking for um, some more challenges. And it keeps parents pretty happy as well, um, which is always a good thing. So um, we've got, I've just showed you potassium in this, the sodium um, is there as well. And it is the little blue circles. Um, and speaking of sodium and potassium, on our next slide, we have one more um, optional extension. Okay, and there's a um, cool video animation here. Someone help me with. Um, active transport. So we have talked about how glucose and how water and how carbon dioxide and oxygen can get into and out of the cells, but that those are all paths of transport. And sometimes you have to have things move against their concentration gradient, meaning that they have to go from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. And that's not going to just naturally happen by molecules bumping around and bumping into each other. So um, you can add another um, protein into your membrane at this point and talk about a, it's a sodium potassium pump. And at this point, you will have three sodiums that are moved out of the cell and two potassiums that are moved into the cell. Um, and that builds a resting potential within a neuron. It's used in a lot of other um, cellular um, uh, mechanisms as well. Um, but the cool thing about this, you have an ATP. And Chris, can you put that little insignia up there? Yeah, there you go. I thought ATP was this thing that was this yellow cartoon that said ATP, and that was what it was produced in respiration. We take glucose, you've got oxygen. It goes into the mighty mitochondria. It spits out ATP, which is a yellow thing, and it's energy, and it also spits out carbon dioxide and water. But you can show them that a model of ATP, and it's just adenosine, which is right here, triphosphate. So the A stands for adenosine, triphosphate, phosphate, phosphate, and phosphate. And so in these processes, you have the energy produced because ATP breaks off a phosphate. And you can see the broken phosphate. And when a bond is broken, energy is released. And that energy does some pretty useful things, like run these pumps that get where they need to be. Um, and Susan, we have two. <sighs> Sorry. Two questions? No, it's a perfect question, because that's pretty much the content they had. Um, to go over. So I'm ready. So we have two minutes is what I said. Oh, two minutes. Two I'm sorry. Minutes. I thought you had two questions. Nope. So, um, we have our um, science and engineering practices here. Cross cutting concepts and disciplinary core ideas. Um, 
And our last slide here just um, tells you that we'll be in the booth right after this. If you want to play around with some molecules, I'll stick around and answer any other questions um, as well at that point. So do we have a couple more questions? Heather, you're muted if you read any questions. Thank you. Gregory said this applies to all cells, plants as well. Thanks. Yeah, you can just keep using this. I mean, you can throw in a cell wall if you're talking with plants. I'm posting a bunch of links, one to our student modeling packs in our booth. I've also posted links to the slides for teacher resources there in the chat. And please join us in the booth. Susan will be going right there after this to, uh, to answer any additional questions. And we have all of our, we actually have all of our 3D MD products available for you to see um, if you click into the live chat in the booth. And like the search popped up as well at the end. Great. And we were comparing, um, Susan used the student modeling pack for her whole session. This actually goes right along with our phospholipid and membrane transport kit, which is the kit that we've traditionally used to teach these concepts. So they work, they pair very well together. I typically put the, um, the full phospholipid and membrane transport kit on whiteboards and a magnetic whiteboard to put little magnets. On the end of things, just order like this strip from Michael's, and I use it throughout the year. I just keep it at the back of my phone. Pull it out when necessary. Well, I think that's the end of our time. Thank you, Susan, and thank you all the attendees for joining us. We we're really happy to spend the last forty-five minutes with you. Bye. Thank you.